Happy Sabbath. We're going to begin our study here on um, the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith by continuing our study of Jones General Conference articles in 1893. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and the time that we could spend studying your word and um, the fellowship that we can have with each other as we study together. We invite your spirit's presence here as we continue to look at the relationship of the Sunday law to righteousness by faith. Help us to understand these things and help us to apply these things to our lives. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we finished off last night, uh, we had finished off with this statement that Jones had made uh, where he quotes Psalm 119, verse 126. And so the significance there was readily evident. We have this symbol of 11.9, which can be um, November 9th, 1989, or November 9th, 2019. And we have this 126, which we have a sim as a symbol of um, uh, the 2520, mini mini tekel Farson from Daniel chapter 5. And we also have noted the 126 years um, from 1863 to 1989, as well as from 1888 uh, to 2014. And then I had drawn on the board, before we even looked at this verse, uh, suggesting that there's 126 years from 1893 to 2019. And, and, I would t and I hadn't looked at this prior to that, so I hadn't even thought about this, this verse in that context. So, so the fact that this verse shows up and we can connect it, um, and, and I drew on the whiteboard, um, last night. So we had this, this connection of this 126 years. Now the idea here in 1893, Jones is saying that the mighty angel of revelation 18 has come down. Is he correct? Well, I think, uh, the Ellen White statements would tend to place that at the Sunday law. Right. But so Jones, it's maybe in a typical sense. Right. So in a typical sense, he is correct. But he doesn't realize that his history is typical. Right? He thinks his history is actual. So he's expecting that we're moving into this Sunday law. And we made a comparison to our history with our typical Sunday law which is the pandemic. Now, both have a characteristic in that the Constitution is being set aside. So we look at our history, we can see that it's a type of the Sunday law. We can see that also in this history dealing with the World's Fair. But what Jones doesn't understand is that the first and second angels' messages have been rejected. And he should know that the third angel's message has been rejected. And that if the third angel's message has been rejected, you can't expect the empowerment of the message. You can't expect the loud cry. So he believes that they're in the history of the loud cry. So I want to look at something else here. <clears throat> Um, and we had mentioned this before, so just to give a really quick review, we have this statement um, that Dwight had brought up last Sabbath, which I was confused about until I read on and found that this statement, this is a, a telegram that was sent to Ellen White 
when she was in Wellington, um, New South Wales, and it was sent from Brother Caldwell, who was in Sydney, New South Wales. And in this, he's asking a question uh, about what's happening at the Chicago World Fair. And so this is in 1893, and it seems that this is near the start of, of uh, this World's Fair. So uh, it seems from the, from the grammatical context, he's saying that it's going to close um, um, on May 16th, and that there is this uh, dedication that's going to happen on May 14th. So he says dedicated, and, and so he may be writing at that time. We don't have a date of when this telegram is, but there was no dedication on May 14th. May 14th was the second Sunday of the fair, which began on Monday, May 1st. Um, and it's going to go for 180, 100, 183 inclusive days that it occurs, so six months. Now, he's asking about these verses, so the former and latter reign in the first month, and he's attaching this first month to the first month of the Jewish year, and so he's suggesting that the latter rain is being poured out, and if the latter rain is being poured out based on what Ellen White uh, would have presented at that time, he would be looking for the loud cry to follow. So we're going to see this. Um, that he's, she's going to respond to this. So she, it says here, in answer to this telegram and, the, and letters that followed, letters were sent to Brother Caldwell and Brother Stanton. Review articles were prepared, and these were reprinted in, it says in Testimonies to Ministers 32 to 62. I, I could only find, um, and I didn't do a great deal of looking, but I could find it in uh, Manuscript Elite Releases Volume 1. So, um, but this here is uh, published, this is supposed to be from, I believe, uh, testimonies to ministers that this is going to be, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and if I took this, this here, so I'll just show you what I'll do. I'll take this, um, oops, I need to show you this. I'm not showing, I'm not sharing the screen properly. Stay on. Yeah, so here is the article. There is the, the statement, the, the telegram she receives, and then there's going to be her answer to this. So she says, the people of Wellington were full of prejudice. The circulation of uh, Can Wright's falsehoods created more prejudice. These pamphlets and telegram dispatches from Brother Caldwell were of a character to confirm their suspicions. For everything of this character gives the impression that we are working undercover. These things were closing the doors against us and hedging the way so that the truth could not advance. These men who engaged in the loud cry movement thought they were doing God's service, but they were working on the enemy's side, not on God's side. So I haven't investigated this in any kind of detail. So I'm not really an expert on what they were teaching. Uh, other than what Ellen White says here, she says, those who published the Loud Cry tract quoted largely from my writings and put their own construction upon them. They claimed to have a special message from God to pronounce the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Babylon, proclaim her fall and call out from her the people of God. They tried to make the testimony substantiate their theory. These publications were misleading to minds and increased the prejudice of many that we could not get access to to present the message of God, a warning to the world of a very different character than that presented in these pamphlets. The history of the children of Israel urged itself upon my mind so that I could not sleep. Many of their experiences were presented vividly to me. My spirit was stirred within me, and I dared not keep silent. I arose at half, half past two o'clock and wrote out 23 pages between 3 a.m. and 12.30, I felt the burden of the people of God, not on account of this one production, but because of many such matters which come before the people. 
and which are claimed to be the messages of God. A little leaven of false doctrine under the inspiration of satanic agencies may work much harm to those who are not rooted and ground, grounded and unmovable in the present truth. No one can be safe in these days unless he is riveted to the eternal rock. We have every reason to be grateful to God and to put our trust in him. The Lord knoweth them that are his. He died to save a lost world, and he is gathering out from it an army who will serve under his banner, and he will present himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Both these men, Brethren Stanton and Caldwell, were at the general conference. Could they not discern there the revelations of the Spirit of God? Could they not see that God was uh, opening the window of heaven and pouring out a blessing? Testimonies had been given, correcting and counseling the church, and many had made a practical application of the message to the Laodicean church, confessing their sins and repenting in contrition of soul. They were hearing the voice of Jesus speaking to them. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So one of the things we see here is we have a false loud cry message in 1893. And this general conference, when did this general conference occur that she's referring to? Anybody know? I believe it was in October of that year. Okay, so the 1893 General Conference, um, if I remember correctly, is going to go from February 20, February 27th, no, January 27th, 1893, to March 26th, 1893. That's the one that... Uh, that we've been reading about. That's that's the 1893 General Conference. So it's going to be in January, uh, February, and March. Well, the end of January, February, and March. And he is writing to Ellen White, uh, this brother Caldwell, in um, probably May, right, of 1893. So he had been at the General Conference. And now he's back in Australia. And now A.T. Jones is saying that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down. And Ellen White is saying that there is a work that had been going on based upon the message that was given. Right? But we also have a false loud cry message in connect, connection with this. What, what do we make of this? Any thoughts on this? I'm just bringing it up here in on my Ellen White disc. Well, I'm just thinking about the midnight cry. You have the Watertown tent going on. Okay. Samuel Snow's presenting. Okay. So we have a true and a false, just like we had on in August of 1844 during the midnight cry. Now, so we're saying that Jones is having a true, typical um, loud cry, so to speak, right? It is, it's a type of what's going to happen, but it's just not the actual. He doesn't realize the line that he's in. Would, would people agree with me on that? Jones isn't teaching error. 
He's simply mistaken about where he is in the line of prophetic history. And uh, where's, what's the reference again for where Ellen White um, gives that credence to Jones's message? Um, where she gives, where she talks about Joan's message that he and Wagner are God's messengers is what he, which you say, no, you you sort of, this year message in in 1893, you said that she was sort of uh, giving credence to it. Well, what she's saying here is that, um, that he had been at this general conference session. So, um, what I had been reading um, regarding the, this meeting, testimonies had been given correcting and counseling the church, and many had made an, uh, uh, a practical application to the me- of the message to the Laodicean church, confessing their sins and repenting in contrition of soul. So she's talking about what happened at the, the general conference. Right, okay, but does that apply to what? Jones, Jones specifically? Yeah. Well, yes, it would It would refer to what Jones was doing. So the message of A.T. Jones at the 1893, and it wouldn't just be Jones. Other people, other ministers, if you read the, the whole 1893 General Conference Bulletin, it definitely looks like the Spirit of God is working there. There, uh, a lot of that opposition had sort of been set aside. People are actually, uh, a practical work is being done. Now, it's going to fall apart after 1893. Uh, in 1895, you see a little more uh, that Jones starts fighting an uphill battle. Um it's, it's hard because we're going to look at this history. We'll try to get this. And I'm going from things that I've read years and years ago um, regarding this. So my memory of all the details is a little sketchy. But that's what I understood was happening. Um, so El, El, Ellen White wasn't at that meeting, but she was um, sort of God was inspiring her from where she was. Right. Yeah, I don't believe she didn't go to the 1893 General Conference. No, she was in Australia or somewhere to got at that right. time. I mean, I'd have to check that specifically, but she doesn't present anything at the 1893 General Conference because um, I have the notes uh, of it, and I, I need to do a bit more research. Now that I have a bit more time, uh, I'm going to try to get more research before we do the next study on that to find out exactly what happened. So... Um, so anyway, Ellen White is, if we look here, I'm trying to look at too many different documents. So here we have basically, this is what, um, this is, when I put that quote in, it gives me this, but it's it's going to be a little bit different. Um, let me see, it's not, because this is the actual manuscript. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, so I wanted to read this. So this is a little bit different than uh, what was published. So I'm going to read the original source. So we're going to read this again, but this is is what she originally said uh, that was put into that article that ends up in the Review and Herald and also Testimonies to Ministers. Those who have published a loud cry tract have not consulted upon me upon the subject. They have quoted largely from my writings and put their own construction upon them. They claim to have a special message from God to pronounce the Seventh-day Adventist Church Babylon, proclaim her fall, and call the people of God to come out of her and try to make the testimonies substantiate their theory. These publications are misleading minds in increasing the prejudice already existing and tend to make it more difficult to get access to them to present the message God has given in warnings to the world of altogether a different character, from the ideas presented in these pamphlets. I rose at half past two o'clock. I could not sleep. A burden was upon me. The history of the children of Israel urged itself upon my mind. 
<clears throat> and um, many points were so clearly pressed upon me that I dared not keep silent. I wrote 23 pages between 3 o'clock and half past 12 o'clock. My spirit was stirred within me. I felt a burden for the people of God, not only on account of this one production, but because of many such matters which are coming to the people, claiming to be messages from God. By their fruits ye shall know them. Matthew 7.20. A number of these pamph pamphlets came to the post office with instruction to the postmaster to hand them to Seventh-day Adventists. The people of Wellington are full of prejudice. The circulation of uh, DM Canwright's falsehoods has created prejudice, making it next to impossible to reach the people. So, so Brother Canwright, or whatever you want to call him, because uh, he had left Adventism, he's presenting messages about Seventh-day Adventists, and this is creating prejudice uh, for Seventh-day Adventists. And everything of this character creates the suspicion that we are working undercover. These pamphlets and telegraph dispatches from Brother C are of a character to confirm these suspicions. So Brother C is Brother Caldwell. All these things are closing the doors of the people against us. The way is being hedged up, us, up by just such things. So what's happening here in Wellington? We got Brother Caldwell who is presenting messages that the Adventist church is Babylon. And we have uh, Dwight Canwright. His name's Dwight, right? Dwight Canwright. What's the M stand for? I, I don't think it's Dwight. Not Dwight? What is it? But, no, just a moment. Dudley? <laughs> just a moment. I hate when they have initials, and I don't know the person's name. Well, I should just change mine to initials then. <laughs> okay. So anyway, what his name is, uh, Dwight will find out for us. Dudley Marvin. Ah, Dudley. Okay. Dudley yes. can write. That's right. Okay. Sorry about confusing his name with yours, Dwight. It's okay. You didn't call it Dwight or D Pink or D Purple, so that's fine. <laughs> okay. So anyway, we have here... Canwright is presenting falsehoods, creating prejudice. And Brother Caldwell is adding to that problem. Can we parallel any of this with what's happening today? Where would we make the parallel? Would we compare Canwright with uh, Parminder and Tess? Yeah, or, or Lady Grace. Another application. Or Lady Grace. Or Lady Grace, definitely. Right. And, and there would be other groups also that are basically calling this movement um, an apostasy, right? Attacking Jeff Pippinger's message. Correct? Right. Okay. And then we have, um, so then we have Brother Caldwell. So how is his message different from Canwright's? How, how would we characterize that message? Because he's calling basically uh, for the loud cry. So he's obviously still an Adventist. We have Canwright who's not part of the message anymore. And then we have Brother Caldwell, who is part of the message. So uh, if I was going to put anything, uh, compare Parminder to anyone, I would compare more to Brother Caldwell. All right. That is, the, what I saw happening, so, so we're not applying this directly to what's happening in the movement today. We're applying this to what has happened in the movement in this history from 2014 to 2019, roughly, right? And so we had a, this movement um, being attacked from those who left the movement, right, in 2014, right, criticizing Jeff. Um, we also had in 2016, Lady Grace came to Arkansas. Uh, she left. 
um, very unhappy and very critical of the School of the Prophets. Um, so we had a lot of this, these people attacking FFA and the message of, of, of Jeff Pippinger, right? But now we have something that's happening more internally. Right, so this is going to be, Par, does Parminder start to attack Jeff and Tess? Are they attacking the message while at the same time saying that we have a message that is the correct message? That is, they're not openly rejecting Adventism or um, this movement. They want to carry on the work of this movement. So aren't they calling FFA Babylon as well in a, in a typical sense? In a typical sense. Yeah. And, and are they calling people out of FFA? Yes. In organization. While claiming that they're the correct organization, right? So, so I think we can look at this history that's happening here. Um, as a parallel to what's happening in our, in our present time. Now, we also know that there is a correct loud cry message being given by Jones. Because Ellen White's going to testify that this is correct. The work that was going on was real. Now, it didn't continue. Right? But it is typical of what was happening in this this uh, movement we have a correct message now i'm not sure how to apply everything here because i haven't read everything yet i don't and i don't know if i understand the whole history completely but i do know we're studying jane uh, jones's 1893 general conference uh sermons he did 24 of them and um, and Ellen White puts her endorsement upon what Jones and others are presenting at that general conference. But there is a work of repentance, confession of sin, that is going on. And, and exactly where we place that in our movement, I'm, I'm not certain, other than to say we have a correct message. And, and Jeff, there, you're drawing lines on my... Uh, oh, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know why your phone does that, but um, I don't know. Well, the the cursor is right next to my mic. Yeah, can, the 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 uh, pencil is right next to my mic, so I yeah, I just I just I, don't know why you're allowed to do that. I don't know either. Not I trying know. to jinx you. <laughs> no, I know. Okay, so anyway, we have this this. Correct message. Now, if we're going to characterize Joan's message, we see that it's a message that is the message of righteousness by faith. And that he, he is um, understanding some things correctly. He's not teaching error. He just doesn't, he just doesn't understand the lines. Could, could we say that about him? Yes. Now, now we're going to have here um, as we go on and read here. So let's let's go on and read a bit more. Um, so she talks about these twenty-three pages of manuscript she sent to Melbourne to be prepared for circulation among our people. Prior to this, I sent a number of pages treating on the same subject. It will not be prepared to go in this month's mail. A little leaven of false doctrine under the inspiration of satanic agencies may work much harm to those who are not rooted and grounded and unmovable in present truth. No one can be safe now unless riveted to the eternal rock. We have every reason to be grateful and trustful in God. The Lord Jesus knoweth them that are his. He died to save a lost world. He is gathering out from it an army to serve under his banner, and he will present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. 
So, so we can see that we have something very similar to what we read in on um, the LNG White site, but it's it's different. It's from it, it's basically the same message. There's some details that are different in each of them. This one presents a little more clearly to my mind about what Canwright is doing. Now, um, she says here, I understood that both these men were at the general conference. So she's talking about uh, Brother Stanton and Brother Caldwell. And, and it says here it was held in Battle Creek February 17th to March 6th, 1893. But Jones was presenting, they have a, what they call the Institute. And that's going to begin on, on um, January 27th. And, it's going, and, and then after the conference, they're still going to have some meetings presented, and those are going to end on March 26th. So it's January 27th to March 26th, including the Institute. But the actual general conference proper, proper is February 17th to March 6th. Um, that is, Stanton and Caldwell, she's talking about, could they not discern there the revealings of the Spirit of God could they not see that God was opening the windows of heaven and pouring out a blessing? Why was this? Testimonies had been given correcting, correcting and counseling the church, and many had made a practical application of the message to the Laodicean church and were confessing their sins and repenting in contrition of soul. They were hearing the voice of Jesus, the heavenly merchantman. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. These brethren who claim to have this wonderful light had the very same work of repentance and confession to do, thus clearing the rubbish from the door of their own hearts and opening the door of their hearts to welcome the heavenly guest. So are there people who claim to present a message but have not done the necessary work of repentance and confession. And would that yeah, there's be always, there's always been that. Right. And so we know that's the problem with the movement today. That we have a work of repentance and confession to do. That we can't expect the empowerment of the Holy Spirit without the upper room experience. Now you know, as looking at Jones, we can see that Jones can see this work going on, right? He can see that there is repentance and confession happening. And so I guess, you know, from what I said before, you know, he shouldn't really expect that the loud cry would be happening. But based on what's happening there, he might believe that the loud cry is happening, that God's church is going to be empowered. And, and that, that's reasonable from his perspective. It's to him, the message of 1888, while it was resisted in 1888, by 1893, um, it seems to him that this message is doing its work. Had they placed themselves in the channel of light, they would have received the most precious blessings from heaven. They would have seen that the Lord was indeed gracious, manifesting himself to his people, and that the Son of Righteousness had risen upon them. This was precious, this was precious, precious merchandising actively carried on. The Council of Christ to the Laodicean Church was being acted upon. And all who were feeling their poverty were buying gold, faith and love, white raiment, the righteousness of Christ, and ISAF, true spiritual discernment, discernment. So that's what she's talking about, precious merchandising. People are buying uh, these things without money and without price, right? Why did not these brethren fall into line and place themselves in the channel of light? They were poverty stricken and knew it not. They were not working in Christ's lines, were not softened and subdued by his Holy Spirit, and were so blinded that they could not see the strong beams of light 
that were coming from the throne of God upon his people. They heard not the voice of the true shepherd. They were listening to a voice of a stranger. Is this true of this movement today? Because we, we can look back. We can see the problems with those that criticized Jeff in 2014. And, and the continual progression of the attacks upon FFA by people from outside. And then, of course, what happened with Parminder and Tess, and the attacks upon Jeff. But can we not see that the message is still being attacked and that we have not fulfilled these conditions? When I consider the infirmities of these misled brethren, I feel deep sorrow of heart that they did not plead with God Bless me, O God, bless. Now I see my error. Thou art communicating to thy people the richest truths ever committed to mortals. These people are not Babylon, for thou hast given them righteousness and peace, and thy joy that their joy may be full. O why did they not open the door of their heart to Jesus? Why not have removed, why not have removed right there all that obstructs the bright beams of the sun of righteousness, that they might shine to the world. While God's blessing was penetrating everywhere, while his presence was consecrating and sanctifying souls unto himself, why did they not place their souls in the channel of light? It was because Satan had cast his hellish shadow athwart their pathway to obstruct every ray of light. Now, what is this hellish shadow that Satan casts, what does it consist of? The pride, the pride in Aaron. And it's an accusatory spirit, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's never made sense to me that there's been so much opposition to this message within the movement. And, and I'm not talking about even just presently, but we go back to, um, let's go back to 2014. So in 2014, a bunch of light came to this movement in the form of chronology. And it wasn't accepted. Now, Jeff understood it, and he knew it was true, and he would give his testimony that what was being presented regarding chronology was of God. But it wasn't embraced by the movement. There was almost no interest. The only interest was from some brethren in Brazil and maybe a few people here and there. But otherwise, not much interest. I didn't realize that, and I thought... Most people accepted it and then rejected it later on. No, was it wasn't really but right from right from the get go, right? People weren't interested in it. Um, in the light that came in regard to the four periods of seven times and dealing with the periods of seven seventy years in two thousand fifteen was attacked, attacked by Mark Bruce and also by um, uh, the, the group in Alabama. So there was an attack upon the new understanding of the 2520 that was coming to the movement. In 2017, well, 2016, uh, when we were at the School of the Prophets, um, Jeff again had recognized the message regarding Ezekiel and the significance. But again, that message was pushed aside. There wasn't a great deal of interest even though Jeff supported it. In 2017, Samuel Snow's letters, not a lot of interest. A few people here and there saw light in it, but the main people in the movement did not pick up Samuel Snow's letters and do anything with them. Jeff took him a year till he started presenting them because he knew they were correct and he had to study them so that he could present them. 
but he knew it was light. In 2018, again, there was resistance to uh, the understanding of the 391 and a half days and also of July 18th. It wasn't until 2019 that this movement finally accepts July 18th. But even then, there's a great deal of resistance. Still Most now, though, right? Yeah, I mean, to the message. And the message. Yeah, yeah. And it still exists. The message and the messenger are being attacked. Instead of examining the light in, from the basis of scripture, people are willing just to attack the messenger. So this is the hellish shadow that obstructs the rays of light. When we look at people, and in either way, when we lift up people higher than we ought to, because that's a great danger, or we look at the person and see their faults, because it's always easy to see the faults of others, because all of us have faults. We have weaknesses, we have blind spots. So you can easily find a fault with a person. But the question is, what about the message itself? Are we going to look at the message? Are we going to spend the time to study it? Are we going to open our hearts to the light that's shining upon us? And the reason we don't is because we have we need a work of repentance and confession to do. <clears throat> How could they come from that meeting where the power of God was revealed in so marked a manner and proclaim that the loud cry was that the commandment keeping people were Babylon. Satan was saying that same thing to Christ when Joshua stood before the angel. Satan was declaring his sins to be so great that he should not be restrained from destroying him. The words of Christ are applicable to these brethren and to all who advance similar sentiments. The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Who clothed him with filthy garments? And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by and the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. The work of Satan is to cover the repentant, believing, commandment-keeping people of God with defiling garments. Jesus Christ commands them, to be closed with his righteousness, garments woven in the loom of heaven. Um, so this work that, that we have been, um, this work of repentance and confession that we've been called to, How does it come about? What's the means? What's the catalyst? What was that again? How does this work of repentance and confession come about? Um, there's there's a, a means or a catalyst that's going to bring this about. Probably acknowledgement. Knowledge that we're poor, miserable, blind, and naked. Okay, so so light comes to God's people. A, a message of warning, right? A, a prophetic message. Do we need a prophetic message in order to have a work of repentance and confession? Or can we just proclaim uh, repentance and confession as a message? I'm saying confession is a start. That's where you start at. Okay. But what's going to lead a person to confess? Mm. 
we need something to confess from. Okay, well, well, we all have something to confess about. Do you know what I'm saying? Though? It can be a basis or a foundation to. This obligation is not because of this here World Fair and the government getting involved with some of the legislation. Okay. So, so we can see that there's a prophetic event happening. Now, what, what Heidi is talking about is there needs to be a, a basis for confession. So we have to have an understanding mm -hmm. of the gospel. But we also need a catalyst that is, in this case, um, we can see that there's this World's Fair and that in, in 1888, Jones had... Um, hindered that movement for Sunday. But now they have this World's Fair five years later. And from their perspective, from the Adventist perspective, the Sunday law is coming, right? Okay, now as a question. Okay. If we were to consider the following in Biblic in the Bible, was there not a prophecy given in the time of Elijah? And did not that prophecy then lead to repentance? Yeah, the, the, the no rain for three years. Three and a half years, right. Now, was there a prophecy given in the time of John the Baptist? Mm-hmm. So the prophecy and the repentance would seem to go hand in hand by the witness of those two examples. Was there a prophecy given in the time of Noah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's three examples. Was there a prophecy given in the time of Samson? Yeah. The birth of the son, right? Yeah. So we have four major events that are all tied where there is a prophecy that is then tied directly with repentance. Mm -hmm. So the biblical examples that are there would, to my mind, indicate that we have the need to understand the chronology and the prophecy and then recognize our great need of repentance. Now, does that make sense? Yes. So you need, you need the prophecy. You need some prophetic impetus or uh, catalyst for this work to occur. That is, the, we need to see that we're a part of prophecy being fulfilled. Now, an interesting point, um, which was misused by Tess, um, if you look at the Sunday law in the United States, the idea that there's going to be a Sunday law in the United States, um, was actually a rather a new idea. I believe it's in 1884 that Ellen White first presents this idea. So um, this is in connection with her great controversy vision. So prior to that, if you read uh, her early writings regarding uh, the Sunday law, she's always going to put the Sunday law after the close of probation. That is, she's going to have this future Sunday law. And she she looks at the issue of slavery as, as a testing message for God's people. So one thing that we can see is that, um, yeah, so just Angela notes that the loom of heaven dealing with Samson's seven locks that are woven into um, uh, the contraption there in the book of Samson. Um, which goes to our morning studies. But anyway, so 
when, when you do a search on this, you start to find that this idea about a Sunday law first in the United States, and then the close of probation, well, followed by the Sunday law in the United States, the loud cry, then the close of probation, then the seven last plagues, and then finally the death decree Sunday law, is, is a rather new idea. It's not something that she initially presents. She does present a Sunday law, but it's, it's after the close of probation. Now, that means there is a change that has been happening historically as the church rejects the first and second angels' messages. That is, the Sunday becomes a test that is going to close probation for Seventh-day Adventists prior to the close of probation for the world. And, and you're going to first see this in the, um, the 1884 Great Controversy. And, and if somebody can find that, that, that I'm incorrect in this, um, let me know. But in my research that I did back in 2019, that's what I found, um, that she's going to lay that out of, of what's happening. So now you see where, where nine years after the 1884 Great Controversy has been published, and Adventists are seeing what Ellen White is talking about as happening. They saw it in 1888, the beginning of that, and now in 1893, they see this work, uh, this prophecy being fulfilled, basically. Now, of course, with the rejection, with the failure of that work, and at this time, you cannot call the Adventist Church Babylon. I mean, you never can. But there is a work that's going on within the Adventist Church. When does that change happen? Um, that we we have a different we should have a different attitude towards the church than what she's presenting here. Because so, some people would look at what we're reading here and they would say, well, your movement is criticizing the church, and you're not recognizing the Holy Spirit and the light that's coming to Adventism from the church. But what happens that Ellen White tells us about? that's going to happen in her, she talks about it in the future, but it has happened. Uh, when would that be? What would mark this change of attitude toward the church? Not that the church is Babylon, but that the church has, has changed. Where, where would you place this? Is it sometime around the early 1900s? Yeah, so if we put 1919, the 1919 Bible Conference marking the end of um, the second generation, what, what's happening there? That we specifically mark? Well, it's a promotion of the understanding that uh, the daily represents something other than paganism, but replies to uh, Christ's intercessionary work in the, in the heavenly sanctuary. Okay, so we have uh, a change in the understanding of, uh, of the daily. Now, what about books of a new order? Doctrine of Christ. Okay, so the doctrine of Christ. Now, I'm just going to read the statement here. <clears throat> the enemy of souls has sought to bring in us the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists. And we see this in the early 1900s. Right, Ellen White, when it comes to the work of the daily, uh, there is this idea, this new view of the daily, and all these things that are going to happen because of their deeper understanding in their minds, right? And that's going to lead to what happens in 1919. And that this Reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this Reformation to take place, what would result? 
the principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. Has any of this happened? Books of the New Order, yeah. And did it happen in, in, in 1919? Are they rejecting uh, the fundamental principles that sustain the work for the last 50 years? Yeah. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded, as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which, without God, is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand, and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. Um, now, we, of course, we know that we are not to go into a mo new movement. And sometimes people will take Ellen White's statements and saying, uh, we are not to do this, talking about presently. But this already has occurred. She's predicting it was going to occur, that it could occur. And it has occurred. Now, we know by... Um, 1989, that the Adventist church is going to be passed by. So just because this has occurred, doesn't in 1919, doesn't mean God has abandoned his church. Right? In 1919? Right. He's still with those who are faithful. Right. And so we have a work that goes on uh, through the third generation, from 1919 to 1957. And the leadership completes that period of time with questions on doctrine. And again, if you read uh, the doctrine of Christ or questions on doctrine, you have to be quite discerning to see where the error is. I mean, the doctrine of Christ really doesn't have any error in it per se. It's what it doesn't have in it that's the problem. It's what it's lacking. And pretty much the same with um, questions on doctrine. I mean, if you're just reading the Alan White quotes, of course, they're fine. It's the headings that are misleading. So, so Adventists aren't really aware of what's happening. But when we get to 1989, the, the church has passed by. Prior to 1989, we have many ministers who are presenting what we would call present truth. Ministers... Adventist ministers, but in 1989, that begins to disappear, and the light that's given to Adventism comes from Jeff Pippinger, from a nobody, somebody who's not trained in our schools. And Jeff begins to be the one that God uses to give this light to Seventh-day Adventists. So we know in, at 9-11, the church has introduced uh, as mandatory uh, spiritual formation as a required course for ministerial candidates, right? September of 2001. Now, is the church Babylon? <coughs> No. No, the church is not Babylon. It's worse than no. Babylon, right? It's in apostasy. It's Jerusalem as a symbol. Now, the question's being asked about um, when did she say that the general conference uh, was the voice of God, was the voice of God that it was blasphemy? Because there is a time that the, the general conference was the voice of God. But there is, uh, so Angela is asking this question if somebody knows the answer to it. <clears throat> but the point that I'm making here is that we don't, 
when, when it comes to this work of repentance and confession, first off, we know it's an individual work. It's something that we have to do. And, and it, it is necessary to bring about unity. So unity is an individual work. You can't just bring people together to be united. You can't have some conference. There has to be something happening upon the hearts of those who are, are participating in that work of repentance and confession. It can't be an external work. It has to be internal. <clears throat> so Satan is causing us to see others and to even to see ourselves differently than Christ sees us. And if we approached the our interactions with others to see what God is doing in people and also to encourage that work of Christ in others instead of condemning them, especially when God has given us light through individuals. It makes no sense to attack that individual. And, and it can be just as bad to praise that individual because it's not about the individual. It's about the message. And the question is, how we treat the message is related to how we treat the messenger, correct? Exactly. Yeah, you, you can't just dismiss the messenger and, and take the message. I mean, because we don't. The reason we reject the messenger is because we're not interested in the message. And that can be pride, jealousy, all these different things that work upon the human heart. And we don't need to praise that person either. That's dangerous as well. Because the light comes from God, not from man. And so when we, when we criticize the messenger, who are we criticizing? Aren't we criticizing Christ? Right. And, and that's what we are understanding here, that we're doing the work of Satan when we criticize our brethren, especially those that God has chosen to give a message. Doesn't mean that person is better than anyone else or anything like that. It just means that God has chosen somebody to give a message. And we need to heed that message and show respect to the messenger because God has chosen them doesn't mean they have authority or that they um, you know, have to be agreed with just because they're a messenger. But they need to be treated with respect because the message needs to be treated with respect. Because Christ needs to be treated with respect. <clears throat> what have our brethren Stanton and Caldwell been doing? If they had been commissioned of God to do this work, they would not need to appropriate the writings of Sister White without consulting her or saying a word to her. If they have so large confidence in the work the Lord has given her to do, why did they not advise her and see if this wonderful message was in accordance with the instruction given her of the Lord? Why did they not have wisdom to go the right way to work? But theirs is a spurious message of the same character of similar messages that men have claimed to have of the Lord. It is not as the bright shining of a candle lighted from the divine altar. When the Lord gives his people light, it is light. It is not darkness and error, leading directly away from the true light which God has sent to strengthen and bless and give hope to his people. These men had no right to appropriate the Lord's goods entrusted to his humble servant to trade upon and improve um, by trade upon them and to place them in the framework of their errors, making it appear that it was the voice of God from heaven giving the loud cry that the church, his chosen people who are keeping his commandments, are Babylon and his people are called to come out of her. And this is a work that we saw happening um, in this movement. 
in the past, and that same spirit has continued. I have no such message to give, but one of an entirely different character. My work is to seek to save the lost, perishing souls, and to teach them as did Paul, who says, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Um, men speaking perverse things. Now he brings before them another class. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Watch therefore and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. In all ages of the world, there have been men who think they have a work to do for the Lord and show no respect for those whom the Lord has been using. They do not make right applications of scripture. They rest the scriptures to sustain their own ideas. Whatever may be the claims of those who draw away from the body to proclaim theories of their own invention, they are in Satan's service to get up some new device to divert souls from the truth for this time. Now, um, so that's the context here, that when we're looking at uh, what Jones is talking about, we see here a work that's going on that is uh, um, approved of by God, this work that's going on in the General Conference in 1893. But we see a counterfeit work that is destructive, that claims to be the loud cry. So you have two different loud cry messages being given at the same, same time. One is true and one is false. Now, is that always true? I mean, maybe we could find examples where we, we don't see that as always true, but I don't know of a false loud cry message in the time of Noah but it might not be recorded. But isn't it generally true that when there's a true message, there is also a false? Yes, and generally the false precedes the true. Mm -hmm. Generally, not always. I mean, sometimes it's a bit more complicated than that. But one thing... Uh, excuse me, please. Yeah, Mark? Uh, so being good... I think in what you did said about night cry and day cry about God did so me. Uh, I remembered, uh, I remember. You guys and Colin, they do and Colin saying about night cry day, and I heard from you, they do and and Colin saying about night cry and daylight cry. God did so me that. I know that kind of door God be uh, unlocked. He has the keys give us to open that door. So a night cry it is like and daylight cry it is like. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, I know, I know the right answer is. Okay, thanks. I know the right answer 
I do to you guys now. He just said, of uh, his second coming, they is about not cry. Daylight cry means get ready, get ready, get ready for my verbal. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Okay. So when you look here um, at this, uh, we're going to read here now from Jones a little bit. Um, so he says, the Lord has sent us a word just now. It is time for the Lord to work. Why? Because they have made void thy law. And of course, we have that Psalm 119, uh, verse 126, that we take as a symbol. Then is not that word the prayer that God has put into our mouths at this time? Are you offering it? Are you living day by day and hour by hour in the presence of that terrible fact that it is time for God himself to work? if his integrity is going to be maintained to all the world. It is a terrible fact. It is a fearful position. It brings us to the point of such consecration as not a soul of us ever dreamed of before, unto the place of such consecration of such devotion, as we'll hold ourselves in the presence of God with that fearful thought that it is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Now we're dealing with the idea of righteousness by faith, that we have to fight against the power of earth, but we have the power of heaven on our side. And this is what we want to see in our personal life. We have to know the power of God if we're going to, uh, we have to be in the presence of God, if we're going to be able to see God work. What is it that but a confession, and a proper confession too, Lord, what can we do? Here is all the power of earth against us. What can we do against this great company? Is not the prayer of Jehoshaphat our prayer also, prayer now? O oh, our God, we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And they stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. What does Joel tell us to do? Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the congregation, Assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between, between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? We stand pledged to the Lord and before the world that we depend upon God, that he loves his people, that he manifests himself in behalf of those whose hearts are toward him. Brethren, there is that fearful word also that touches the very thought that came to us from Australia. It is in the testimony entitled, The Crisis Imminent. What does that say? Something great and decisive is to take place, and that right early. If any delay, the character of God in his throne will be compromised. Brethren, by our careless, indifferent attitude, we are putting God's throne into jeopardy. Why can he not work? God is ready. Are not God's workmen ready? But if there is any delay, the character of God in his throne is jeopardized. Is it possible that we are about to risk the honor of God's throne? Brethren, for the Lord's sake and for his throne's sake, let us get out of the way. Let us get out of the way. The only way to get out of the way of God is to flee to him. That is the only way to get out of his way. And that is where he calls us now. Here we stand. He has given us the prayer. Oh, of all things when God has given us the prayer, how heartily and confidently can we present the prayer and ourselves upon it? He has given us the prayer. He has told us the word. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. And then another thing. If we need anything to cause us to be sure that that is all so, there is that word that was read last Sabbath. 
from the last word that came from Australia. Brethren and sisters, would that I might say something to awaken you to the importance of this time, the significance of events that are now taking place about us. I point you to the aggressive movements now being made for the restriction of religious liberty. God's memorial has been torn down, and in its place a false Sabbath stands before the world. So he's quoting Sister White there. Not, not is going to be torn down, but has been torn down. The testimony that came last winter, last year this time, said that a great move would be made to exalt the false Sabbath. What now? God's memorial has been torn down, and in its place a false Sabbath stands before the world. How fast God's word is fulfilled these days. One male brings the testimony that such and such things will be, the next mail comes, it is. One mail brings a word from the Lord that efforts are being made to do such and such things. And the next mail brings words from the Lord, that thing is done. Brethren, should not we stand as minutemen, ready to respond to God's word on the instant? There's no time then to lag for an instant. Brethren, let us seek God with all the heart. These testimonies that Brother Prescott read the past hour bringing us face to face with this thought of calling upon God for his Holy Spirit. Is not that the very evidence of all the work, of all the message, and everything else before us? Then is not the text applicable, which I took last night? The people who will now see what is soon to come upon us by what is being transacted before us will no longer trust in human inventions and will feel that the Holy Spirit must be recognized, received, presented before the people. God's memorial has been torn down, and in its place, a false Sabbath stands before the world, while the powers of darkness are stirring up the elements from beneath. The Lord God of heaven is sending power from above to meet the emergency by arousing his living agencies to exalt the law of heaven. Now, just now, is our time to work in foreign countries as America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy in forcing the consciences of men to honor the false Sabbath. Now, not to set up the false Sabbath, but to honor the false Sabbath, which has been set up, which stands before the world. Then this word came to us under date of August 30th, 1882. After quoting the scripture from Revelation 3, it says this, Remember, therefore, from which thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. The chosen people of God have lost their first love. Without this, all their profession of faith will not save a soul from death. Suppose the attention should be turned away from every difference of opinion, and we should heed the counsel of the true witness. When God's people humble the soul before him, individually seeking his Holy Spirit with all the heart, there will be heard from human lips such a testimony as is represented in this scripture. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. There will be faces aglow with the love of God. There will be lips touched with holy fire, saying, The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. So that's a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. And, and what is Ellen White saying is going to happen? What is she pointing to? What event? The Angel of Revelation 18. Yeah, so it's the red, and, and Jones is saying now this has happened, right? So he's taking this testimony for, I think, 1882, he said, and he's saying, you know, now this is being fulfilled. Brethren, let that be a word that will come from every lip in this house at this institute, in this church, before this institute and conference shall close. Has not God um, made this plain enough? Made the way plain enough? Has he not made it plain enough in the events that are standing before our faces and from which we cannot hide our eyes? And let us open our eyes and our hearts and bid the Lord come in and take full possession and use us 
just as he pleases. So um, we're going to end there. A any final thoughts about what we have read, what we've studied here? Uh, so manuscript 37, 1901, April 1901, when Ellen, Ellen White spoke in the Review Chapel, um, the voice of the General Conference ought to be the voice of God. I've thought it almost blasphemy because some in connection with it are not men of faith and prayer. So that's the, about the General Conference in 1901. Now, there's a whole history behind that as well. But um, we can see here that we have a work to do. As we see the prophecies fulfilling around us, we have a work to do. And that's not the work of criticizing others. It's the work of recognizing our own sins. And that work began under the proclamation of the third angel's message from 1888 to 1893. But it didn't continue. And the work has begun in our time. We want to see that work continue. And it's up to us as individuals. Uh, you said yeah. that the World Fair began on the 1st of May? May 1st, yeah. Okay. So that's like the first day of the fifth month, which connects with the midnight cry. Yeah. So yeah, we're now. Yeah, so it's also. Yep, yeah, pardon? It's also. It was also the same date when the Nashville centenary or bicentenary, whatever it was, um, occurred as well. That was on the first day of the fifth month when that fair opened. Okay. Or so I think that was like uh, four years after. I think it was 1897. Yeah. No, the, these, these are all connected. There's, there's lots of symbols here. Um, and we can see, of course, we know that our message is connected to the Nashville uh, um, World's Fair. So, so there's something, something going on here in this history that we need to understand. Um, I don't think when we was the, when was the Nashville World's Fair? Well, it was four years after the Chicago World's Fair. Okay. So I don't think it was a World Fair. I think it was a, a bicentenary or a yeah. It, it's not really a World's Fair, but it, it it's kind of like a World's Fair. I mean, centennial. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. What what specifically was it called? Yeah, I think it was like a centenarial centenary. Of what? Just how like a hundred years of Nashville is a time. Um, yeah, let me see. Or it could be 200 years. 200 years was in 1976. Okay, so that was from May 1st to October 31st, 1897. It was the Tennessee Centennial International Exposition. So it is a type of World's Fair. Um, they just never called them the World's Fair because the other one was the Columbian uh, World Exposition. World's Columbian Exposition, oh, yes. Columbian Exposition, yeah. So this is still a World's Fair because they happened every four years. Um, and it's basically the same length of time, except uh, this one goes to October 31st, 1897, instead of October 30th in 1893. So it's one day longer. Um, yeah, so, so they are connected to the World's Fair. Okay, so anyway, there's, 
there's still more we're going to study about these things as we go through these studies to understand what was happening. Okay, let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the time that we've had this Sabbath afternoon to study. And we ask for this work of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts that we can see truly our need of you that we can manifest a character that um, is meek and lowly, that can reach those who are searching for truth, and that all pride and jealousy and the characteristics of Satan, of accusation, will be removed from us. Be with each person as we continue to study and grow and learn. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.